Whitaker. You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California. Here's your host, James Whitaker. Let's go. Welcome to week six of quarantine, but more importantly, welcome to episode 25 of Win the Day. The title for today's episode is Five Strategies to Win During a Recession. We're going to give you examples of companies that are still doing well today that were actually founded during a recession. So you can learn more about what they did and apply those lessons in your own life and business. And like the title suggests, we'll also go through five strategies that you can use to win during a recession. The quote for today comes from Greek philosopher Plato and says, necessity is the mother of invention. Necessity is the mother of invention. That essentially means that if you absolutely have to do something, like your life depends on it, you'll be much more determined and resourceful to see the impossible and make it a reality. This quote is what helped companies that have since become household names, as we'll go through later. There's a good chance that circumstances of the world have made it more necessary for you to think creatively, to provide for your family, and think about what impact you want to have on the world. So this is perfect timing to think about creating something that lasts and something that gives you the lifestyle you want for the future. In case you missed it, make sure you go and check out our last episode, Eight Ways to Make Money from Home. I've been getting some really great feedback from that episode. So thank you to everyone who reached out to me after watching or listening to it. It's available on YouTube and as a podcast. So I'll link to both of those in the show notes and you can go and check them out. Like we've been doing for the last few episodes, we'll start this episode with an analysis of how COVID-19 is progressing to help you understand the trends. The better you understand the trends, the more empowered you'll be. So what's been going on in the world? Well, we've seen the stock market recover somewhat. When at one stage it looked like it was going to halve, the major indices have rebounded strongly. At time of recording, the S&P 500 index is only about 17% off its previous high, which was achieved in February this year. And the NASDAQ, the one that captures more of the tech and IT stocks, is the same price as it was in November 2019, just six months ago. All that seems a little odd since we were at the end of a record 11-year bull market run in the US. And since then, obviously, COVID-19 has gutted economies around the world with unemployment, death, travel bans, you name it. And a lot of that is difficult to just kickstart once more. The majority of companies who are probably running a little fat to begin with which is just what happens when times are good, they're not just going to click their fingers once we can all leave our house and all of a sudden everyone will have their old jobs back. I understand the reason the market has rebounded so strongly is because the worst case scenario has been taken off the table. I mean, at one stage, it seemed countries like the US and Australia and many others were going to get overrun like Italy and Spain have been with a shortage of hospital beds and ventilators and staff, but that just hasn't been the case. An article last week in major newspaper, The Australian, which you can guess what country that comes from, suggested that the government's reaction was in fact a huge overreaction. The article in The Australian noted that only 2% of available ventilators in Australia was being used. Only 2%. And there's another 3,000 ventilators on the way that aren't factored into that percentage. In California, where I live, it was predicted to be one of the hardest hit spots, which didn't eventuate. In fact, last week, Californian doctors and nurses have even been flown to New York to help with patients there. And New York, the real epicenter in the US of the whole coronavirus thing, has now stabilized its healthcare enough, so much so that it's sending ventilators to other states like Michigan and Maryland. There was a report recently from Stanford scientist John Ionidas that offers an interesting insight, suggesting that in pretty much everywhere around the world, including some of the COVID-19 hotspots, that the virus represents the same threat that simply driving your car does. He concluded that the risk of dying from coronavirus for a person under the age of 65 was the equivalent to the risk of driving a distance of nine to 400 miles by car each day during the COVID-19 fatality season. But the big issue with all these opinions is the lack of accurate data, as we've been saying on the show for a long time. And that isn't to, to say that the Stanford scientist, you know, it's I'm not to knock him, It's to argue that it seems like every single source has it wrong together. We're all in this together and we've all got it wrong because a lot of the modeling is also based on that data. Reports have come out about doctors getting paid more to diagnose COVID-19 in patients in the US too. 
Essentially, doctors are paid up to three times as much, even if there hasn't been a lab test to confirm the diagnosis. Obviously, this would inflate both positive cases and deaths that have been attributed to COVID-19. And even Johns Hopkins, who runs the website that is considered the gold standard of reporting for this whole ep epidemic, of this whole pandemic rather, which is where I've been getting uh, my statistics from that I've shared with you in this show, even they have come out and said that it's basically just estimates that they're using. It's still no guarantee that any of these sources are accurate. So there's still so much uncertainty and we have no idea how accurate the 150,000 deaths attributed to COVID-19 actually is. That doesn't give us a great deal of comfort since we only know that we don't know anything. Obviously, this has huge ramifications for when things open up again around the world. I mean, it's hard to create a plan without the data. Last week, the retail figures for the month of March were released for the US, and it showed the biggest decline since the Commerce Department started tracking this data nearly 30 years ago. Retail sales fell almost 9% in one month alone, which is obviously an important metric since consumer spending drives two thirds of the US economy. And another interesting development is that countries have started to pay their own companies to relocate production out of China as part of their own stimulus packages. We saw Japan do this, as I mentioned in the Win the Day Facebook group last week. And what's most interesting is that the incentive that these governments are providing is not necessarily for their own country's companies to come home, back to their home country. It's to incentivize them just to leave China. We know that China has been very militant in the South China Sea and with many other things that they've been doing. So this is a non-confrontational way that neighboring countries and countries like the US can do to fight China's influence on the world stage. When the dust settles on this whole COVID-19 thing, it looks more and more like China is going to be one of the biggest losers from it. There's also a company that's working to develop immunity passports, and they have just raised another $100 million in funding. This company has been working with governments to use technology that could be used for things like passports that include vaccination data and medical results to help countries better determine who they let into their country, or for people who are in that country, it helps them figure out what parts of the country and what parts of society that they can interact with and access. Clearly, there's many potential complications with that, but it's a really interesting insight into where the world is heading in the digital age and obviously the implications of this virus. And to finish our around the world analysis on a good note, there was an odd story out of Australia last week when a couple was fined more than $3,000 for posting a throwback photo to a boating holiday they were on in 2019. The police ended up revoking the fine, but it's not doing much for public sentiment when people are seeing police resources being used for things like that. Well, that's an overview of what's happening around the world. We know the health news is starting to appear better than the complete doomsday scenarios that were once forecast. And obviously that's a good thing. It's also a good thing that Wall Street is so optimistic, even though I have my own reservations. I mean, the stock market prices in the future. It doesn't price in the present. But my gut feel is that there'll be more bad news to come and more slumps to come as a lot of this data comes through throughout the rest of the year. As I said earlier, most companies aren't just going to click their fingers once we're allowed to leave our homes and everything goes back to normal. Plus, in the last four weeks, 22 million Americans have filed for unemployment benefits, and that's just a truly staggering statistic. There's still so much uncertainty around how we interact with each other and what things like travel, sporting events, and other public gatherings look like. So that's sort of what's underpinning my caution about where the stock market is at the moment, only being 17% off with the s and that we mentioned earlier and the NASDAQ being the same price that it was in November. I guess overall we can't open communities until a comprehensive testing tool is made available. So we'll be waiting with bated breath for that to be released. That covers COVID-19. Now let's talk about what you can do about the situation we're in. Again, check out the last episode, episode 24, which we went through eight ways to make money from home. And for the rest of this episode, let's talk about five strategies to win during a recession. Number one, look at what has worked for previous recessions. There's a survey that The Hustle did earlier this month. They basically looked at more than 200 small businesses and how they survived the global financial crisis of 2007 to 2009. If you're watching this episode on YouTube, you'll be able to see this chart in its entirety. But for those listening to the podcast, I'll quickly go through some of the most important points. 
The most common strategy of these companies was to cut costs so they could operate leaner. We said earlier in this episode that companies get too fat when times are good. That's why a downturn where you can determine what the real essential costs are can be a good thing for the long-term health of the business. And obviously the long-term health of the business is good for the staff too. The next most common strategy from this study was flexibility. You heard me say in episode 22 of the show that it's important to pivot, not panic. The same strategy that you use to launch your business is never going to suit your business forever. You need to adapt and pivot where you need to as the economy changes, as the needs of your clients change, and as the entire competitive landscape changes as we've seen here for the last couple months. Those two steps alone, cutting costs and pivoting, made up 43% of the approaches used to survive the global financial crisis. Again, check out the YouTube episode if you wanna see the full chart, but it's important to remember that huge downturns in revenue actually forces the business to get creative or the business dies. Remember our episode quote, necessity is the mother of invention. But if you panic, you won't be able to do anything. So that's number one, look at what has worked for previous recessions. Number two, focus on trends rather than paychecks. In episode 24, it was mainly suited for those who wanted to make income right now. But in this episode, we're talking about people who have the means to be able to allocate time to a longer term strategy. Your focus should always be on the bigger picture and long-term growth if you can do it. But if you're working two jobs to put food on the table for your family, obviously it's a different story. But as much as you can, play the long game. An example of a trend is the technology that is being used to help companies like food delivery services, things like Uber Eats and Grubhub. That same technology will inevitably be applied to dozens of different industries as it becomes easier to operate and more effective. Therefore, your best opportunity now, using this example, might be to start becoming an expert in logistics tech. Then when companies start hiring again, which for tech companies is soon, because as we've said, the NASDAQ has been much more resilient than other indices like the Dow, you'll hopefully have developed enough expertise in logistics tech that will get you a foot in the door. And if you map that out five years, 10 years into the future, especially if you do other things I recommend in this show around doing the right thing, around establishing relationships, then the sky really is the limit for what you can achieve in that time frame. Contrast that to accepting a job as an Uber driver, which is an example of a job doing it just for the paycheck. There's nothing wrong with that. Again, it depends on your circumstances. But it's much better long-term to be handy and familiar and eventually an expert in the tech that runs Uber rather than being a driver who will eventually be replaced by automation with no discernible skills to your name. If you become an expert in logistics tech, you will be able to develop your skills and of course your salary will increase as you continue to add more value to these companies. So that's number two, focus on trends rather than paychecks and play the long game. Number three, succeed with what you've got. Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak gave an insight into how he and Steve Jobs were able to create a business that would change the face of personal computing forever. Wozniak said that wanting to do it for themselves was the primary motive, which made it far more purpose-driven than any salary that a corporation could have given them to do it for the corporation. Wozniak said, if you can convince somebody to want something inside for their own personal reason, they really see something that they want to do and they really feel it in their heart, that's when you get a lot more done. You can't motivate people with a high enough salary to do what you will do when it is for yourself. Obviously, that's very true. When just a tiny startup, Apple's biggest weakness was that they didn't have a dollar to spare. Yet that ended up being their biggest strength. Their biggest weakness ended up being their biggest strength. Wozniak noted that every big win they had at Apple was from having two things in their favor. First, a tight budget, and second, never having done it before. And a lot of you can hopefully relate given the circumstances that we're in, and a lot of us use those as excuses as to why we shouldn't start a business or as to why we shouldn't act in a certain way. The lack of budget meant that they were forced to succeed with what they had. And never having done it before meant that they approached their work without any preconceived notions which underpinned the innovations they were so famous for. Wozniak in particular became very good at figuring out how to do things inexpensively. He said, I had no money. I had to get a lot out for the least in. And I was very good at that. 
Adding to his determination, Wozniak was busy creating a product he wanted that didn't currently exist. He knew there was a need, a problem, and he got to work on creating a solution like we spoke about in the last episode. So that's number three, succeed with what you've got and reframe it to being an opportunity rather than a challenge. Number four, profit first. You've heard me talk about having an emergency surplus when it comes to managing your personal finances, but rarely do companies do this. Entrepreneurs in particular are far more likely to sink every dollar and every minute into their business, which can put them in a very precarious financial position, even if the business starts to take off. There's a book called Profit First, where the author, Mike Michalowicz, talks about how a simple counterintuitive cash management solution that you implement from day one can help small businesses break out of this doom spiral. He talks about doing this through a behavioral approach that takes profit first, and then what is left is used for expenses and everything else that is needed to run the business. Not only does this build up a cash reserve without you even really noticing it, like the emergency surplus I just mentioned, but it forces you to run lean, get creative with managing your business, and allows you to ride out any market downturns or recessions like we're experiencing now. It's definitely worth a read, and I'll include a link to it in the show notes if you wanna check it out. So that's number four, profit first. Number five, know that it's possible for you. I wanted to give you some examples of companies that were founded during a recession to help you understand that. My aim here is that you recognize that if it worked for these people, it can work for you too. But you need to be in the resourceful mindset to make it happen rather than being in the panic mindset that of course leads to inaction. So here is a list of companies that were started during a recession. Number one, Apple, who we mentioned earlier, they were actually founded on the tail end of the 97, sorry, the rather the 73, 75 recession brought on by the oil crisis. Apple also had to reinvent themselves once more after the early 2000s recession that was brought on by the dot-com bubble and September 11 attacks. Apple CEO Tim Cook even reiterated in an earnings call a few years ago that we believe in investing during downturns. So that's Apple. Our second example is Netflix, which was founded just prior to the dot-com bubble and was almost sold to Blockbuster. Eventually, the cash-strapped company weathered the storm, and it's now arguably the world's preeminent pioneer of consumer video streaming. It's a great example of thinking differently. So that's Netflix. Number three, Airbnb was founded at the end of 2007, just as the global financial crisis hit. Using the circumstances as an opportunity rather than a challenge, they offered short-term living arrangements for those who wanted an alternative to expensive hotels. Despite battles with various levels of government around the world, the company is valued today at more than $40 billion. Then there's personal finance company Credit Karma, who went live in February 2008 as subprime mortgage panic gripped the world. The company's founder, Kenneth Lin, shared his thoughts on what that period meant for his company. He said, as the recession took hold, the economy was tough, funding was scarce, and there was widespread distrust from consumers. I learned in those early days to focus on the long term. Building and scaling an impactful business requires a drive beyond making money. Having the passion to deliver on your company's purpose will fuel you through the trying times. And I really love that. So that's Credit Karma. Groupon launched in November 2008 as a way of rounding up people to buy a certain product for a group discount. It ended up being perfect timing for increasingly price conscious consumers, which is obviously what happens during a recession. And today, Groupon is valued at half a billion dollars. So there we are, five companies launched during a recession, and there's many more out there too. Companies like MailChimp, uh, Warby Parker, Dropbox. So that's our last one, number five there, and important for you to know that it's what's possible is possible for you. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I'll include links to a whole bunch of things in the show notes to help you out. And remember to check out episode 24, eight ways to make money from home if you haven't seen it yet. Just a reminder to join the Win The Day group on Facebook. I'm excited to announce that due to popular demand, the new segment Wine The Day is here to stay and will be held every second Friday night. 
So grab a drink of choice and join us from wherever you are in the world while I answer any questions you have, and I might even bring in a special guest or two like I did last time. Also, if you're enjoying the show, if you could hit subscribe and share it with friends, that would be amazing. Remember to get out there and win the day. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always.